it's Mitzi and Mike, and this is the Wave Social Podcast powered by Arcade Studios, a show for marketers, creators, and brand builders who want to make waves online. We sit down with the experts and tastemakers behind today's up-and-coming brands, and today on the show, we have Kaylee Reed. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, I like this episode, but today's a big day for us. Yeah, it's four years. Today is four years since we've officially started our business, Arcade Studios. Wow. It's our arcade anniversary. Which is special. That's quite a word. I don't know if we need to brand that or anything, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it is a big day. We launched a playlist. Yeah, we did. We posted a playlist on our uh, Instagram at Hello Arcade. If you want to go check it out, but yeah, I got I'm in my in my feels today because I went through my <clears> camera <throat> roll and went back to like the early days of when we actually started Arcade and just looking at some of the videos that we would take and. I felt so much cringe because we thought like the stuff that we were doing then that we thought was so cool and so innovative is just kind of laughable now. Like we've, it's good to see that because we've obviously grown so much. Our team has grown, our capabilities have grown. Um, but it just, it, it just made me laugh a little bit and it makes, makes me wonder four years from now if, if I, if I will think that what I'm doing today is cringy. Yeah, I think that's inevitable. We were just talking about this on a different podcast interview mm-hmm. recently, just how your tastes change. So it's not really that what we were doing was bad. Right. It's just that our tastes and preferences and perspectives have evolved. Yeah, but it was good. It was good <clears throat> to see that because we, even in those early days in our old office, like if you remember, like we were so stoked in our office that was literally empty. We had nothing in there except for desks. It was just a room in a building with just desks and chairs. And, chairs. and those chairs weren't even ours. We were like yeah, borrowing them. The desks them. weren't either. No. And so it just feels good to kind of see that too. And you could tell in those videos, like we were so pumped on it. Yeah. Um, and now we have a much bigger office, furniture of our own, much bigger team. Cool yeah. It's stuff. good to, to come from humble beginnings. Totally. And look back on it for sure. The founder journey isn't an easy one, but no. I'm grateful that we have a partnership that we mm-hmm. can do it together. And um, it's been awesome to see the milestones. Now we're in a great office of our own, everything in here we own. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that was quite a process yeah. and we have our own podcast studio. So yeah. that's pretty cool too. It took, it took us four years, but yeah, I, I wouldn't change anything about the journey. It's yeah. Fun. Me neither. We, we got a long ways to go. Yeah. So more to do. Yeah. And the types of clients have changed too, that we've worked with. Absolutely. Yeah, I think like a big milestone for us in addition to the office was also just the fact that early days, we a lot of the brands that we worked with were through other agencies. Mm-hmm. We were more of like a subcontracted agency. And that was a big change that happened for us this year was now really a huge majority of the clients that we work with are our own relationships. And right. we don't rely so much on other, on other agencies, which allows us to do more of what we want to do, what we think makes the most sense. Yeah. And that will work out best for our clients. Yeah, it's pretty fun. So on to the next four years. Yeah. Let's do it. And speaking of founders, Kaylee Reed, she is a founder. She has an agency of her own called Hermana. She's been working with influencers over the past seven years. And now Hermana agency is all about that, managing a curated roster of influencers and sharing net resources with a network of over 1,500 influencers. So she's legit. Yeah. And she's also now the founder of a new tech company, which she gets into in the episode. It's really interesting because the the idea for this new company has come out of a pain point that she's experienced at her agency. So her company is called Norm. She talks all about it. It's in the influencer space as well. Um, and they're building tools to help creators negotiate their worth. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Let's call her in from California. Let's do it. Okay, here we are. We have Kaylee Reed back on the show. We're so excited to have you on the show again. Um, and there's so much. I'm that so we, excited to be back. I know we have so much to talk about. So much has changed since we had you on our show. So um, we're going to try to unpack as much as we can. Um, first, I'm going to start with Hermana, which is your agency. And that's what we kind of talked about last time you were on the show. Um, give us an update. How are things going there? Mm-hmm. I feel like the last time I talked to you guys was the inkling stages of Hermana. I haven't even listened to the episode since I think we recorded, so I'd be curious to go back in here, kind of the growth between then. But yeah, I would say like 2020 and 2021 were really big growth years because we saw so many companies, as I'm sure you guys did too, investing more in digital and shifting more of their marketing dollars to influencer partnerships, which were still really new pre-COVID. 
And then as soon as a lot of these other channels were no longer available to market on or companies felt really pressured to increase their presence digitally, we saw a really big boom with influencers. So for those who don't know what we do at Hermana, we manage a roster of influencers, which basically means that we manage brand deals for them. We help them monetize their platforms. And we also work on the brand side, helping brands find the right influencers to work with and kind of managing that full campaign process from scouting influencers to negotiating the deals to contracting and reporting analytics afterwards. Um, and so, yeah, things have been really good last year. It's crazy. Like this time last year was still really just me full time with a couple of contractors. And now we have two other salaried employees in addition to myself and a growing team of part-time and contract people. So we're still really small, but it's been a lot of growth in the past 12 months, which is really exciting. What's that transition been like for you? Like going from just delivering a service and acting as an agent to actually managing a business and a team? Oh man, it's hard. It's really challenging because I mean, my background, I've always been an entrepreneur and I've always worked for myself. So I don't actually have the traditional agency experience of running an agency or being part of an agency. And so really everything that we've built at Hermana has been from my personal experience of, okay, I think this is how we should do it. And like, this is how we see most beneficial for influencers, but whether or not that's traditionally right, um, I don't know. So I think that's both a benefit and like a con to us sometimes is we're really new in the space and we're doing things the way we want to see them be done. Um, but it comes from a place of me not having that traditional experience. And so when it comes to managing a team and building and hiring, it's really scary to let go of some of those tasks and those roles that I have loved doing, especially working directly with influencers, like you develop such a strong relationship with these people, similarly to anybody on a team that you're working with. And so getting to the point of growth where we're now bringing on people that are managing those relationships that I don't necessarily get to talk to these influencers every day is scary, but we did it out of a point of either needing to grow or remaining stagnant and keeping things the way that they were. And it was a decision for me as an entrepreneur of, do I see this becoming a million dollar business, a multi-million dollar business, or am I happy just making what I'm making now as a freelancer and turning down more clients? And the overall vision that we had for Hermana was to continue to bring kind of a new standard to the industry and help more creators monetize and see their value and worth as creators and as digital entrepreneurs. And I can't help everyone do that. I need a team surrounding me. So it kind of came back to looking at that vision and saying, how do we do more of this? Well, we need to hire more amazing people that can help us bring this to more influencers. I love that. Yeah. That's... I think we're, we're a little bit biased because we didn't have agency experience either when we started <laughs> our thing, but I think it's better that way. Yeah. You know, there's so many agencies are just bloated and expensive without a lot of value. And mm -hmm. so coming in with a fresh perspective, I think it gave us an advantage and it likely is giving you one too. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that over the last couple of years, um, the demand for influencers has increased with brands. But I'd also like to know a little bit from your perspective of like how the relationship between brands and influencers has changed over that time. Because I'm sure, you know, not just like etiquette or like um, the types of deliverables, but there's probably other intricacies that have evolved over time because the, the industry moves so fast. Mm -hmm. It moves so fast. And as much as it feels now like influencers are a huge part of every brand's marketing strategy, there is still a lot of brands and agencies, I guess, that don't have a full grasp of what partnering with influencers really means and how they can partner with influencers. And so I think the biggest shift that I've seen is just the adoption of influencers and everybody knowing, okay, we need to work with influencers. This is the new way to reach our customers in an authentic way that helps them feel connected to our community. But beyond the adoption, there's still a lot of, I think, gray area of how these programs are being implemented and how they're being compensated and all of those other pieces. So I would say the biggest shift pre-COVID 
working with influencers, you know, maybe let's say 50% of brands. I don't know what the actual stat is, but some brands knew, yes, okay, we need to work with influencers. Now, 2022, it's like every single brand is incorporating influencers in some way. The adoption is there. And what we are going to see in the next few years is like that adoption now becoming all of these additional channels of how you actually work with influencers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so interesting how much things have changed. And another thing I've noticed too is like we're talking right now about brands and influencers and the partnerships that you are facilitating. But there's also like these influencers who are creating their own brands and they have their like own Mm -hmm. either products or, you know, even just a personal brand or they're becoming personalities with like, you know, deals for a podcast or whatever. Building a course. Yeah. all So many things. So what has that like, how has that influenced what you're doing? And like, how do you kind of manage almost like both like partnerships with brands is awesome. But then also like you said, monetizing their platform, like what does that look like now? Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So what we're seeing now is more influencers wanting to create businesses and not just be content creators. And I think this shift is really important and really valuable for anybody who is a content creator online, online or wants to be a quote unquote influencer. You don't need to limit yourself to brand deals and revenue from brands and sponsored ads as a content creator. You can create other revenue streams for yourself if you understand how to create digitally, A, how to build a community and what other skill sets you offer. And so from a manager and agency perspective, now we're not just helping our influencers uh, negotiate brand deals and see those through, but we're also helping them launch merch lines, strategize around uh, workshops that they can host, um, look at speaking opportunities, PR, other ways that they can monetize beyond relying on brands. And so it's really fun because we're seeing these new projects come up that influencers are now leading to us, not just as brand deal managers, but like kind of like a CEO in a sense where we're coming into these influencers overall brands and helping them develop in other areas. Um, But it's also challenging because a lot of influencers don't necessarily have either the financial backing or the team surrounding them that really is required to build a business outside of just content creation. And so that's something that now we're looking at. How do we continue to kind of be flexible with what influencers need and not just manage that one side of their business, but more holistically? Can we get a little bit more granular about the service that you're providing then? Like the idea that you, that influencers or creators are looking at you as almost like the CEO of their business. What, what does that suite of services look like? Because CEO (laughs) is a big job. Totally. Yeah. And I actually, I I stole that from Zach from one day and he, he mentioned that to me on a call the other day, he manages Yes Theory and a number of other um, big YouTubers. And I really love that mentality of managers, not just helping organize brand deals, but helping influencers grow their businesses almost like a CEO would. And so what we do at Hermana day to day is everything from taking over your inbox as an influencer, managing deal flow, negotiating rates, to also like the more businessy side of things, reviewing contracts, taking over invoicing, a lot of these logistical things that influencers don't need to be bogged down every single day doing. You should be focusing on creating content, building your community, and strategizing for like the overall vision of what you want your personal brand to be. We come in and kind of manage all of those other things, take the brand deals off their plate, um, help them organize their day-to-day, help them organize their content calendar, strategize around how much organic content should they be posting versus sponsored content. And now outside of this, just like managing brand deals, we're also helping influencers uh, find Airbnbs when they're in LA and, and connecting them with other agencies and influencers to collaborate with. Um, finding the right merch partners for when they want to launch a line based off of a video that just went viral, Uh, helping influencers get on podcasts, PR pitching, all of these other things that you really don't have access to unless you are involved in like a much larger team. And when you're a content creator, everything falls on you. It's like you at the beginning of a freelancing or entrepreneurial journey, you're wearing 20 different hats 
as well as doing the thing you actually love doing, which at the end of the day is creating content. And so we're trying to come in, take all of that business stuff off of their plate so that they can continue to grow an audience that we can monetize further. I think that's so fascinating because it's, it feels like people are learning how like a creator and being a creator and someone with an audience or an influencer, they have a community. Like you said, they've done that so well. They're really good at creating content and now they have to like learn to be entrepreneurs, which is such a steep learning curve. And being all of us on this call can relate to that. So I think it's so interesting that there's like this whole new breed of people who are trying to figure out how to like build a business based on this, you know, platform they've created. Uh, But there's no one who's like, talking about how to do that like all the like Mm nitty-gritty stuff which is why I mean it's cool that you guys are supporting your clients that way yeah and I mean some influencers too don't necessarily want to be full-on brands and business owners some of them have careers outside of being a content creator and we come in and manage the content piece for them so that they can go and be a day-to-day doctor or a lawyer or whatever it is that they're doing in their quote unquote, real life, but are still monetizing the content piece. And so it's really interesting to see how this creator economy is not just for people who want to be a full-time influencer on TikTok day in and day out. It can be that, or it can be that you are somebody in a profession that's also creating content about that profession and monetizing off of that. Or it can be someone who wants to build a brand and they know the way to build the brand is to build their audience first. So there's all of these different avenues that we're seeing um, creators coming into and we're trying to match our services to meet all of those needs. Nice. So for those up and coming creators out there, whether they're doing it full time or it's just like a side hustle or it's a side hustle for now and they want to go full time eventually, but they don't have an agent, you know, like. If, whether it's specifically with Hermana or just an agency in general, how do they get noticed and what does it look like to find the right partner? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, for us, we really look for people that can create great content and create great communities. And so what that looks like in practice, we basically have an internal checklist of, okay, okay, does this person A, meet these kind of base standards of vanity metrics, which we typically look at 100,000 followers on at least one platform and typically 20,000 on their other platforms to show their audience conversion. Um, And then also looking at certain engagement rate metrics and their niche. And so beyond the vanity stuff, which is baseline mostly for brand deals that we see in the brand context that we work with and knowing what brands are looking for. We're also looking at their niche and type of content that they're creating. So is it different and unique and an interesting spin on an already very saturated uh, space online? There's a thousand, you know, lifestyle, fashion, beauty influencers, but what makes you stand out a little bit and what piece of your story are you telling that makes people really resonate with you more than the average influencer. And so that's like part of what we look for. Um, And then I think too, like some baseline things that we don't talk about a lot in the industry, but general professionalism and ambition and wanting to be in the space and taking it seriously. There's a lot of people creating content that don't take it seriously as a profession and don't treat it that way. And so when you're working, especially on the brand side, since that was a lot of what we were doing prior to talent management, it became like pulling teeth trying to get content from people. So we do a lot of like intro calls, trial sessions, vetting to see if these influencers are the right fit for us at Hermana and for our work style. And there's a ton of different agencies out there that are willing to sign smaller influencers or different niche influencers. For us, we know kind of where our contacts lie and what we're best with. So if a really amazing fitness influencer comes to me, I'll probably refer them to someone else because we don't do a lot of fitness deals. We focus on kind of more lifestyle, fashion, beauty area. Um, But that's kind of generally what we look for. That's so interesting. I want to talk about niching down and I want to get your perspective on that. Like you mentioned how important it is to like really define what's special and unique about 
the content you're creating. Um, but then there's also conversations happening about how niching can feel a bit restrictive too and and how to break out of niches. Like what's your perspective mm-hmm. on that? <laughs> Uh, this is a battle that I have internally every single day, honestly. I think what I've concluded is that very specific niching can be great for growth and reaching very targeted audiences. But if you want to build a very long-term sustainable, sustainable brand, niching down that specific can be limiting. And so I'll give a few examples. Um, One is when we look at brand deals generally, brands are much more likely to partner with very general lifestyle influencers because they can see themselves fitting into that influencer's content more easily than if I'm a finance influencer, I'm very limited to partnering with financial brands. Financial influencer, for example, again, might also create content around this niche that their audience is really interested in. But then the question becomes, is your audience interested in your content or in you? Mm. And so what we see with a lot of niche influencers is that they're great at creating content around their niche, but not so great at letting their audience get to know them outside of just the niche content. And so it's two very different types of influencers. And you can have a ton of growth in very niche uh, accounts. But I think the more long-term play is to build a brand around your personality and inject those niche content pillars into what you're doing, which can help you stand out from the crowd of just being a general lifestyle influencer. And so I struggle with this. Like my, you guys know, I think the last time I was on the podcast, I was just starting TikTok stuff and I don't even know if I had gotten into the Gilmore Girls <laughs> niche yet, but over COVID, my content really pivoted to becoming a Gilmore Girls fangirl account because mm-hmm. in COVID, that's all I was doing was watching Gilmore Girls. And it was the inspiration for all of my content. <laughs> and what I found once I built an audience around that specifically is it was a lot harder for me to branch back out into lifestyle content because people came to me for Gilmore's, they didn't necessarily come to me for Kaylee. Mm. So now where I've been kind of struggling personally is branching outside of that niche and how do you maintain a really connected and engaged audience if at one point you do want to transition niches. Um, I think this is something that can be really limiting for influencers and sometimes people create brand new accounts or They just like sacrifice engagement when they switch niches. So there's like a lot. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I think that there's, you know, benefits. But overall, I'm leaning more to the not niching down as much because I think it's more sustainable long term play. Yeah. So the goal is to like get people to fall in love with you and like trust you and also Mm -hmm. have interest in the things that you're passionate about. So it's like alignment Mm -hmm. with you. That's really exactly. Cool. Yeah, I've never heard it talked about that way, but it makes a lot of sense. It, mm-hmm. It's one of those things that seems common sense when you hear it. Um, but it, and I also feel like maybe there's there's still the potential to like build a following around you with niche content, but just maybe instead of just having one, you have a few. It's almost like a collection of your interests that you're you're allowing totally. those to your niches, but then it still ties back to who you are. Is that kind of what you're saying? Totally. And I also don't think it's impossible to switch niches or transition your audience. I just think it takes a lot of work and a lot of strategy. Mm. So for example, with my Gilmore Girls account, which was very much a private fangirl account for a long time. Now with my businesses, I'm like, okay, this is a missed opportunity for me to not talk about my work and bring some of that back into this audience of 56,000 people who follow me. And so what I've been testing is like, okay, what is the story that still connects this original niche content to me as a broader person? And so with the, I'll use, continue to use the Gilmore Girls example, I've been telling the story of a fangirl to founder and how I went from being a Gilmore Girls fangirl to now a founder of two companies and how those things are connected. And it's really hard to do that storytelling, but 
I think that's how those really niche influencers can connect and like bridge outwards to the rest of their content if they want to build more of a lifestyle brand is connecting your niche to other things in your life. Mm -hmm. Speaking of TikTok, it seems like it's still like the place where you can go viral and get that growth really quickly. I mean, when you compare it to Instagram, it's just like it doesn't compare in any way. Um, <laughs> do you have any like firsthand experience either from like your roster or yourself of how that's happened and how to kind of for anyone out there who's listening who wants to grow an audience and maybe they're just like starting to invest in TikTok? Like what does any tips that you have for growing an audience there? Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is I have been feeling like Instagram Reels is very competitive with TikTok lately. And I don't know if you guys have have seen this with any of your clients, but I was hard team TikTok for the past two years or since our last interview. And in the past six months, I have seen really incredible transformations from influencers that we've worked with who have gone from zero to 30,000 new followers just through reels posting very similar strategy as tiktok but because reels is still kind of considered new compared to tiktok now like using similar strategies you can reach these vast audiences on both platforms so i think tiktok where i'm seeing a lot of consistent growth now is with people that are teaching other people how to grow on tiktok (laughs) It's kind of funny Um, because to me, it's like, of course, that content is going to to do well because everybody wants to grow. What's a lot harder to do on TikTok now and really on any platform is grow as a lifestyle account or like as somebody who's just sharing pieces of themselves. And I think it's this combination. We talk about it actually with some of our influencers. It's like, what's the trifecta of a viral video? And for you, it might be different than for me, than for Carly, but we've kind of pinpointed for some of our influencers, okay, when you use a trending audio with a text overlay about your niche, these three things converge to do really well in your account versus another influencer, their original content might be the thing that goes viral. And now people are hooked on that type of storytelling. And it's, I think, consistently doing whatever that thing is that pops off for you. So it's really hard because I feel like the platforms are so different now compared to two years ago where you could go viral for, you know, eating a banana, like in the, the most basic things. Um, but it's it's been really interesting to see this competitiveness from Reels who are really trying to steal creators from TikTok now. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like... I feel like we see more consistency on reels with like even like two, three, five thousand views or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. But I feel like we've maybe seen less virality, like mm-hmm. hitting the two hundred or five hundred thousand views on reels. I don't mm-hmm. know. That's that's my perception. Where like on TikTok, it, the average might be lower, but then the ones that take off take off more. That that's what I've seen personally. But mm-hmm. I feel like there's yeah. no rule really. So no, you're so right. And what we're still what we're still seeing for some of our influencers too is that TikTok audiences are deemed as less valuable to some brands because on TikTok your content is primarily being shown to the for you page and not to your followers. So you could have a million followers on TikTok, but if your content isn't hitting the for you page, your million followers are not going to see it. It needs to perform well on for you and for your followers versus on Instagram, you're just seeing the content of people that you follow. And so from a brand's perspective, we're seeing a lot more value still placed on Instagram because they know those communities are likely more connected and engaged with that influencer versus on TikTok. You could follow someone and maybe never see their content again because you're scrolling your for you page. Most people don't scroll the following page. So mm-hmm. it's been really interesting to see like how those things are valued differently, where in my perspective, TikTok's a lot more valuable because of that effect of potential virality and 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 predicting views that way. So it's mm-hmm. been really interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about brands on TikTok specifically. And I know you've done some work with brands and you've worked with our agency. Um, mm-hmm. How do you approach a brand who wants to jump on TikTok? Like, how do you get them in the mix and get started? Yeah. Um, brands on TikTok are so fun. 
but a totally different ball game because for for listeners if if you don't know you don't have access to the majority of trending sounds on TikTok as a business account because most of them are considered uh, copyright. They're not available for commercial use. Um, and so the way that brands need to play into TikTok is very different than if you're just a creator and you can jump on all of these trending songs. Mm-hmm. And so we really look at Um, I mean, we haven't done a ton of TikTok work with brands lately because we've shifted so much more to the influencer management, but the few that we have been working with, it's really been a conversation of let us take over all of the creative and have fun with this and have like a Gen Z voice on it. And it's going to look completely different than what all of your other socials look like, but you have to trust us because what works on every other platform is not going to resonate on TikTok. And if it looks like an ad or if it's too focused on the product, it's not going to hit. And so that's been really fun for us because we're able to come in and like lean into memes and like certain trends with audio that are not copyright. Um, but it is a totally different strategy because of that. And so if there was 50 of me, I would love to do more work like that. But we've really found like over the past six months, we're trying to put our efforts into how do we like really make one pillar of Hermana our main strength and expertise. And we found that's the talent management. And so that's where we're really growing now. Would you say that every brand should be on TikTok or is it more still like the right the right brand to platform fit? I don't think every brand needs to be on TikTok. And maybe that's an unpopular opinion from someone who really loves TikTok. But I think there becomes a point where it doesn't always make sense. And if you're trying to force a platform for your brand, it's not going to resonate. The same way that I don't think every brand needs a a Twitter account or a LinkedIn channel or you know, a Facebook page, like, I think Instagram for every brand a must, but these other channels have such different conversation on them and communities that you really need to know your audience and know like who you want to target before trying to invest in a channel like TikTok. Okay. Right. I don't need to see TikToks about like mutual funds or like life insurance. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Like I I think some brands do a really good job of that, but like does TD and CIBC and BMO, like, do they all need TikTok accounts? And like, what does that look like? I don't Mm -hmm. know. Like maybe they they likely will all, if they don't already have that. But from a consumer perspective, I just, I feel like some brands are better suited for the platform than others. Totally. Um, Switching gears a little bit here, as someone who's been deep in the influencer space, can you tell us about some of the pain points that you've been seeing and how it's led you to start another business? (laughs) (laughs) Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So I've been working with influencers for eight years now, which is longer than I've been doing a lot of other things in my life. But influencers have been a consistent piece of every business that I've worked on. And I started on the brand side, hiring influencers, scouting influencers for my own brand, e-commerce brand. And then freelancing, consulting, helping brands implement these influencer programs, and now working on the talent side, helping influencers negotiate deals and continue to grow and build. And every stage has had these gaps that have been really difficult to navigate, especially for small and medium-sized businesses who I think get left out of the equation because um, a lot of the influencer dollars are coming from big brands and really large influencers are expensive to work with. And so I think a lot of like platforms and solutions that have been built have left out micro influencers and small businesses along the way. So I started noticing these gaps throughout, I would say the past like three years, specifically building campaigns for brands and working with influencers and became really frustrated to the point where like we built our own notion system with everything that we need to manage influencers because there wasn't a platform that solved all of those programs problems for us. And so we just kind of took to piecing things together and manually doing things ourselves. And the questions that we kept getting from influencers were, A, how much do I charge for this? Like Every single day, someone asked me this question. I got this brand reaching out. How much should I charge for this? 
or on the brand side, how much should we budget for this? Like how much should we pay influencers? We have a budget of $25,000. What does that get us? Mm -hmm. Um, So that question being repeated every day. And then on the day in and day out of managing talent, uh, reviewing contracts or contracts being non-existent in the brand deal management workflow, Um, but understanding that contracts are very important in how we do business and influencers oftentimes being taken advantage of because these big brands are sending contracts from their legal team, you know, L'Oreal, Revlon, these massive companies that send 20 page contracts. Do all influencers read these? No. Do all influencers know what they're signing away when they sign in perpetuity rights? No. But it's just become part of the industry because it's moved so fast and the knowledge hasn't like kept up with the industry. Mm -hmm. And so these were like some of the things that we were dealing with. And, you know, contracts take a lot of time to review. And who do you go to if you don't have a lawyer? Like if you're an 18 year old TikToker getting paid $10,000 from L'Oreal, like do you call your dad's lawyer friend? Like what do you do in those situations? And so, um, I started, I guess this time last year, I started having conversations with a VC firm about building tech solutions that would not only help our agency workflow, but also help influencers who are self-managed and businesses and brands who don't necessarily have somebody in-house to answer some of these questions um, and create a new standard in the influencer industry of how things should be priced and what value is actually attached to a lot of these influencers. And so after about, I want to say like six or eight months of like back and forth and creating business plans and ideas and what would this look like and, you know, what is really missing from the space, we did so much customer research. We looked at so many existing platforms, and we found these repeating patterns. One being, there's a lot of platforms that exist to connect influencers and brands and have them do a transaction, like marketplace platforms. Um, But 99% of them are built with brands in mind as the client. And so unless you are a big brand who wants to spend $25,000 a quarter on this software, you don't have access to these types of tools and platforms. And unless you're an influencer who's doing a deal on these platforms, you don't have a reason to log in every day because it doesn't help your daily workflow. It's just an opportunity to apply to you know, a casting. Mm-hmm. And so what we built, started building back in September is uh, Norm. And Norm is initially a pricing calculator and a contract reader for influencers and agencies um, to use in their everyday workflow, whether or not you're getting a brand deal through Norm or through your inbox, you can use these tools to help understand what you can negotiate and what your worth is for the deliverables that this brand is asking for. Um, But with the overall vision that Norm is eventually going to become a platform that influencers can use day in and day out to manage their ongoing projects, to Uh, project their finances to integrate into some of these other larger platforms that now it becomes their hub for like their entire content creator business, a dashboard that they're logging into every day and brands are able to transact with them that way. So this was all kind of born in the past year and only now coming to fruition. We finished 90% done the MVP and started soft launching in February um but yeah that's where we are now so exciting that's awesome great work kaylee i love it thanks guys it's so so crazy to be able to say all that out loud now yeah no kidding um i love hearing about the pain points i think a like influencer or pricing calculator and a a contract contract reader like that's so smart and so needed there's not like an authority or like support for those things so i think that's a great way to enter the space and i love the idea of like creating some sort of like hub for creators or influencers because like the average like i don't know maybe you know this more than i would but like creators and influencers they have multiple deals running at the same time 
and like managing all those pieces and deliverables and like would it be a place where you would be like a brand would be reviewing deliverables or is it just like a kind of like a space to organize all of it? Yeah, both. So the way that we used to manage all of these deals at the agency was spreadsheets and Trello boards <laughs> and piecing together things from these different, you know, project management, task management softwares to try and equate that to the influencer industry. But it wasn't built for influencers. And there's very few platforms actually built for the way that influencers have their daily workflow. There's a lot of things for entrepreneurs, but influencers aren't quite seen as entrepreneurs yet, which hmm. still kind of boggles my mind. And so we're trying to create that same solution that, you know, maybe an, an entrepreneur might download Dubsado or HoneyBooks and use that to like initially run their business. Now an influencer can have a similar tool, but it's suited for this industry and for the multiple deals and ways that they're monetizing. So similar to like what we built on Notion, there's places for their contracts, their files, their task management, their to-do lists. You can upload content for approval, like all of these pieces that again, we used to piece together from different things now coming into one place. That's awesome. Is this the first time that you've raised like venture capital? Like how has that process been for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have always bootstrapped my businesses in the past and product and service-based businesses are also very different than tech. Mm -hmm. So I am not a technical founder, um, which means that I can't really bootstrap a tech company unless I had a technical co-founder that was building everything with me. So this is my first experience uh, raising money, being a tech founder, which is weird to say out loud. And it's been definitely, I don't want to say challenging because I don't think that's the right word yet, but just a very different mentality to go from being an entrepreneur knowing that, okay, I need to hustle and monetize and sell this and you know pitch myself here in order to pay bills now like being a tech founder you can't monetize the thing until you have it right <laughs> and so my job as a founder is to go out and pitch the idea and raise money so that we can continue building the thing and reach those milestones that we've projected we're going to reach so it's definitely a bit of a shift in mentality mm -hmm. but it's been really I think like helpful for my role at Hermana too, and just how I'm leading there as well. Yeah. How are you juggling both of these like growing businesses? <laughs> Nervous laughter. <laughs> <laughs> it has been hard. Um, but when I, when, when I entered this partnership um, in the fall to start building Norm with some of that capital up front, the investors actually additionally invested in Hermana so that we were able to really have that quick injection to hire more people to kind of replace part of my role there mm -hmm. as we grow mm -hmm. so that I didn't need to worry so much about that. And I would be able to split my time between the two. Um, so that was one thing was not just having the capital for the new business, but also having a partner that saw the value in Hermana and Norm that these two things feed into each other and bring expertise and clients and eyes to each other. Um, and so continuing to build up the Hermana team so that I can be taking some more time to build up Norm because at the end of the day, Norm is a tool that will save us time and money at Hermana. And so while my role at Hermana is changing, it's with the goal in mind that in a year from now, our workflow at Hermana will be very different. And instead of manually reviewing contracts every day, you'll save those 30 minutes and maybe spend it on a call with the influencer building a relationship or doing kind of more fun strategy work instead of that tedious day-to-day -day work. So mm -hmm. it all plays into each other, but man, it's hard. <laughs> like really? You guys know, you, you know, building a business, one business is hard, two business. I can't imagine like 
having kids, like you guys do it all too. So <laughs> you know exactly what it's like. Yeah, it's it's not easy, but nothing worth it is easy. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to know, like, for anyone who's listening and is ex- so excited about these features that you're releasing with Norm, like, what? How can they learn more? How can they get involved or sign up? Yeah. So our website with a waitlist is it's norm i t s n o r m dot a i. Um, same with all of our social handles, and we're collecting waitlist right now. So everyone on the waitlist will have free access to Norm when we launch because we want to use that as our beta users to collect feedback and be able to build the product better until we like really fully go out and do a big marketing push and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so our anticipated launch for the first MVP is in the spring (laughs) just coming up i mean it's already spring but um sometime in the next like month or two and right now i'm raising our pre-seed round so talking to a lot of investors but additionally taking a very untraditional approach which is having some influencers and agencies be part of our initial round because to me norm being built by the people that will be using it every day is really important and having some influencers and agencies that work in the space every day on the advisory board and having ownership in the product um, that can help guide us as we scale is really important so we've actually taken this untraditional approach and really like reduced barriers to investment we're taking on kind of no minimum investment from influencers that want to have ownership and norm and agencies that want to build strategic partnerships. Um, And so we have our first angel investor who is an influencer actually, um, and that's really excited about the future of norm. So that's another avenue that we're kind of accepting uh, conversations around too. Cool. That's interesting. So for influencers or agencies that might be interested in that, Can they just reach out to you and start a conversation or how do they? Yes. Yeah. I've had people message me in DMs. You can email me. How I will, I will get back to you. If this is about norm, I am always available Um, because yeah, it is something that, I mean, this too is providing another avenue for the influencers that we're working with and, and talking about investment and what does that look like? Because what we've noticed is, a lot of influencers, once they're financially successful, might start other businesses or brands, but don't necessarily take an investment route in becoming angel investors or look at tech as an option to additionally grow their worth. Um, And so we're also doing education around what angel investing actually means. So if you're an influencer or even a micro influencer or you know, even some of these agency partners that we're talking to who have never invested in a tech project before, and they don't know what that means. We're helping actually guide them with that education of, okay, this is what pre-seed means. This is what the valuation of the company means. This is what your investment could potentially become if Norm is successful in what we're doing. And so that aside from like having people involved in the creation of Norm that are in the industry, Um, I also think it's important to have that as an avenue for influencers to look at when they're expanding their worth and uh, their kind of personal brand and business as they grow. So it's been really fun to have those conversations because uh, I think a lot of people think that investing is not accessible to them and not to say that this type of investment is accessible to everyone, Mm -hmm. but the way that we're doing it is trying to kind of democratize so that this truly is a product built by the people that will be using it every day and not just a VC backed (laughs) company. I love it. That's really cool. Um, Yeah. Thanks guys. Yeah. Kaylee, you've, you've started multiple businesses. Obviously you've had a lot of great experience over the last eight years. Like you said, Um, one question we've started asking that's one of my favorites is just if you have a piece of career advice that someone gave you at some point that's just stuck with you that you can pass along to our, our listeners. Oh my gosh. I was trying to think of this earlier and it's hard because I've had so much great advice, but I think the one thing that I was talking about with actually a couple of our influencers today is 
And this is actually, okay, I'm going to say this one because this is actually a piece of advice that one of my mentors gave me this week too, which was a lot of people know business or can give advice about business, but only you know your business the way that you know it. And so um, I was talking to one of our investors about like, oh, should I, like, how should I grow this? Or like, should we do this? And he was giving his like general business advice from his perspective, but he was like, Kaylee, at the end of the day, like, you know your brand, you know your business, you know your vision, only you can make those decisions. And I think as an entrepreneur, there is so much external feedback that you can get really caught up in of like this person's advice or this TikTok guru said this or this person grew to you know this amount with this strategy doesn't mean that it's right for you. Mm -hmm. There's so many different paths to success and what I did is probably very different than what you guys are doing. And that doesn't make either right or wrong. It just means that there's different ways to getting to the end goal. And if you don't know your end goal, there's no wrong path. You can take any path. I didn't know that I was going to start a tech company. I had no idea. This is not planned at all. But I just kept saying yes to things that excited me and that I was passionate about and took paths without like an end destination. And that's okay sometimes too, because I do see a lot of advice that's like, you know, planning things out in a certain way and feeling like you need to know your vision for five years from now to manifest it. And like, I don't know any of these things, mm -hmm. but that's okay because you can take different paths and still come to an end point that's going to be right for you. So I don't know if any of that, any of that was helpful, that's but that was just on my mind from this week. Yeah, I feel like that's freeing. Yeah, for sure. For people. You don't yeah. overthink it, just follow your intuition based on what you're building and where you're at. Mm -hmm. It's so good. And following what excites you, I think is so important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. Another question we like to ask all our guests is who's making waves right now and why? Oh yeah. This is a great question to you guys. So many people are making waves. Um, but I'm going to tie this back to one of the things we were talking about earlier, which was influencers not just seeing themselves as content creators but as business owners and i'm going to shout out my girl carly carly polkosnik who is at your girl carly she was one of the first influencers i started managing and she's also one of my best friends um, but she's an example of an influencer who has tested and tried so many different avenues outside of brand deal revenue and is really seeing herself as an entrepreneur and a business owner versus just a content creator. So rather than relying on brand deals, she started a clothing line two years ago. She's working on a sex tech company this year. She's doing a number of different things, speaking engagements outside of just brand deals that are really holistically building her brand. And I just think it's a really inspiring way for creators to view their path is you don't have to be limited to these sponsored ads you can look at and test other avenues for monetization too. So go follow at your girl, Carly. It'll be in the show notes. Love it. Okay. Last and final Perfect. question for you, Kaylee, is how can listeners connect with you? Yes, you can find me uh, at Kaylee.e.r on Instagram. If you want to watch Gilmore Girls content on TikTok, it's actually Kaylee. <laughs> and Hermana Agency is H-E-R-M-A-N-A dot -A agency. And there's probably other places, but those are the main ones. Love it. Perfect. And Norm, what's Norm's handle? Norm is it's norm.ai everywhere. Love it. It's rare to get the handle Norman, everywhere. Thank you guys. Yeah. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the, that's the daily struggle with new brands, but I'm respect. Kidding. I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kaylee. Well, thank you thank guys you. so much. This is awesome. This is great. We're excited about it.